the small, quick version of the three steps it takes to worm, parcel, and serve. One more plank to reach the water line. Reed, uh, Garrett's brother, who's helped us out a couple times. You've seen him on maybe a few episodes. I'm walking from our boat. Nice the launch ramp. He's launching his boat right now. Running over, seeing his boat going in, covered in sawdust, while wow, we're still very much on the hard. We're next, we're next. We were in need of more sheathing planks, so while Garrett milled more lumber, I checked out Tyler's rigging project. So he's got his rig all sort of modeled up here. And today we're doing the last one. It matches this guy. So ultimately, this is what it's gonna end up looking like. Traditionally, rigging was wormed, parceled, and served wire, or further back still, hemp rope. Tyler's chosen for his rig to blend the two. Worm parcel and serve, but the inside, Kevlar rope. Now we're going to be doing this one on the matching side. So this is the intermediate. This is the last shroud. It's a three-quarter length shroud that doesn't go through the spreaders. It goes right to the jib stay or where the staysail attaches to the mast. So awesome. This will also actually end up being a running back. It'll be attached rather than with lanyards. It'll have a little block and tackle. It'll be able to move aft in heavy weather to have a little bit more aft pull. Get you more tension on the rig. Exactly. Yeah. I've been measuring it from both directions uh -huh. to kind of double check it. So what I do is find a total length, and that's here. Okay. And then I also find oh, the length that I want it to over. be from the base of the eye to the base of the eye. Oh, okay. The base of the eye will be right around this line. This. On this side, it's 11 and 3 quarters, mm -hmm. and that's a little bit longer and fits around the bigger thimble. Okay. It'll end up being the dead eye at the base of the shroud. This is the same on both sides, 12 inches for the tail that gets spliced in. Okay. So this will be the eye, and this part will come up to here and be the oh, okay. part that gets the, spliced the splice into back the back over. Yeah. Now what we're going to do now is worm the part that will go around the thimble. So this that's is all just gonna an be anchor, at the and this is going to get thimble. cut off. This is what we're doing right here is actually going to get cut off. What I'm really trying to worm is here. Oh, here. I see. So I'm running okay, it a little bit long because it is a bit of a pain to get it started by yourself. But then with a short bit like this, it's really easy to take all three. And now I understand the concept of worming. So this is worming it. It's basically like your fairing wraps. So when we tape like and then we serve tube. it. We tape to parcel and then we serve it with the twine. Yeah, it's just gonna be nice and round and there won't be a lot of gaps. If you just wrap the twine around and left these gaps here, that'd be a void in there. Just like in your woodworking, when you're bedding something, mm -hmm. you don't want voids. It's gonna hold water. I don't think there's bugs that eat Kevlar yet, but. This process is chafe, weather, and also it's almost waterproofing by the time you're done. It's wrapped so tightly and then it's painted at the very end. Yeah. Pretty much completely weather sealing. Pretty this, impervious. This process. So, Filling all the gaps is key. We're doing this just to make the part that'll go around the thimble. But after that, once we get them spliced, we'll lay it out again. And we'll do this on the whole thing. This is one of the most important parts I've measured exactly. Because if I serve too much here, when I wrap it around the eye, I won't get a tight splice. I won't get okay. a tight marriage. At, at the base. Yeah. And it's hard anyway. We're also seizing around the throat of the splice to get mm -hmm. it extra tight. So traditionally, this part you'd take canvas or cloth whatever you had basically that would hold some tar and you dip it in tar and wrap it around the rig and that's gonna especially when you were using hemp rope that's a really big rot protection kind of thing you'd you'd soak that cloth wrap it around and then when you serve later it's gonna squeeze it all out it's gonna make it into one nice big preserved mass of tar. This is kind of the modern, 
easy, quick way of doing it, and this is some friction tape that's cloth tape. And anyone who used electrical tape 30 years ago probably knows this is just electrical tape. But uh, it's cloth tape and it's got some tar in it. So you can smell, it smells a lot like the synthetic tar that's used in that twine that we're gonna serve with. And, and then after your, so this is the parceling part, right? So this is parceling, we've wormed. Okay. So then after we serve it after this, it's surprising how much of that tar, what you're talking about, squeezes out of that tape. Right now it's it feels pretty dry, tacky. it doesn't get on my hands, but mm -hmm. when we put that much compression on it, it squeezes up between the passes. Yeah, all that serving. And it also gets warmer, and sometimes you even get a clump of it on the mouth. So, we've wormed, and we've parceled, and there's a little saying, you worm and parcel with the lay. This is a right hand lay, my right hand can follow it, so I'm gonna go with the lay, I'm gonna go around that way. That's why you see I go around okay. really in the mm -hmm. same direction that the strands of line that are That the rope is going, by. okay. Yeah. So this is the worming, we're parceling, and then serving is just wrapping it crazy tight with more of that twine. You're using the same twine, right? Same twine. Number 36 seems to work really well with this 3 8 inch rope and uh, yeah, the other thing too is that you can worm, parcel, and serve almost anything. Stainless steel, not advised. I guess it kind of depends on some oxygen to build up a little oxidative layer. Yeah, totally. But then it won't rust any further. But when it's kept away from oxygen, not so good. For but stainless. galvanized wire, if you weren't as worried about weight, galvanized wire is going to be a cheaper option than this. About the same strength, galvanized wire is going to be a little stronger. This is about the same strength as stainless. Galvy is a little stronger, way heavier. A little cheaper too though. And you can mm -hmm. use this process on that and if you do it right, galvanized wire can also last for decades without ever rusting. You can almost go back to how it used to be done and get a lot of advantages over the wire, especially in the weight savings. Yeah. I mean, this and rig's gonna be a tenth of the weight that it was before. It's gonna and be from 300 pounds down to 30. And would you say that the, the Kevlar rope like cost comparison to doing the wire, which is sort of the other way to do it. People, people it's do it these days. More expensive than galvanized, mm -hmm. for sure. Galvanized, you could probably get it down to somewhere near a dollar foot for this size boat. This is a little less than two fifty a foot, but it came out cheaper than a lot of the stainless that I looked at. So right. compared to doing a stainless rig, this is a lot cheaper. And it's and then you're getting the added benefits of the strength and saving the weight aloft. Yeah, well, so, you get the same strength at a tenth of the weight. Yeah, and ideally, rather than stainless, it needs to be replaced 10 years, 15 years tops. If you're looking at this, if you keep it painted and you keep it out of the sun and you keep it from chafing, it could la it'll hopefully last longer than me. Some of it was tested after 30 years in the sun without being wrapped, and it only lost about 5% strength. That's I incredible. I have to verify that, but that was what I heard, <laughs> yeah. and it made me feel really good about yeah. the fact that we're also weatherproofing it and preserving it that much better. Yeah, let's wrap these up. All right. Serve. Let's serve it. Serve it. Serve it up. It was really cool to be able to spend the day filming and learning about rigging. Not too long from now, Garrett and I will be doing the same. We've talked about Kevlar rigging, but George Bueller prescribes galvanized wire. Our boat can take the weight, whereas our budget can't take the expense. Still, many more conversations to be had and decisions to be made. It's wise to inform yourself of all the possibilities and techniques, but cautionary too not to overwhelm yourself. Every boat is as unique as its owner, and some things boil down to preference. Kevlar rigging is a hot new topic, and we're excited to see somebody do it. Twist it tight, and if you look really closely on there, if you pull it, you can see the whole thing will shrink. Oh, look at it go. <sighs> and there I'm putting probably at least 100 pounds on it. Tyler taught me how to bury my lines at either end of a serving, and eventually to slosh the whole stay in blacking. But the coolest tool is what actually does the serving. So this is the fun part. Bringing out the mallet. We're gonna start around the near side of the handle. So the 
This one made some grooves, it's got some marks, but we're gonna start there. And what I've been doing that works really well is just crossing over to the other side. So just to the other side of the handle and then wrapping. So this is where you get your friction and the and more tension. wraps the more, more wraps the more friction. Some options are if it's not getting tight enough to the last pass, if it's not rolling up tight on the shroud, you put two over here. I've seen people do two on each side. Which is kind of where some of those grooves are, right? Exactly, and this has had different configurations. Mm -hmm. Right now, on that side it probably looks like one. On this side it's two, so we call that one oh, and a okay. half Got it. round turns, or one and a half full turns. Full turn will cover the whole thing. It's not just over and back, that's half of a turn. Okay. So this has got one and a half turns on the mallet, just about three on the handle. Like I said, there's a lot of different configurations, but this one's been working for this. I really like the setup because I can actually spin the spool. Yeah, with give it. Give it just enough slack that it'll stay tight. So if I feel it really tight, I might spin it a little bit faster, catch up. Or if I feel it a little loose, I can actually just hold this tight for the wrap, you can see how much tighter it gets. So you have really good control. This mallet, and a larger one like it, are serving mallets, designed for this purpose. The larger mallet was passed down to Tyler by a common mentor he and Garrett share. Charged with preserving maritime history, Tyler's managed to breathe new life into this experienced tool, and has it serving a modern adaptation of a traditional rig. <laughs> what we're going to do is use this little messenger line. Now we're burying the tail. Now what we have is just the tail running back under the, the serving there. So like I said before, nice. I'm going to pull it tight that way, but also kind of in the direction it was wrapped. And that locks it in and pulls out. And when we pull tight on that, should wrap up these really tight on the tail, and that's what's going to just bury that whole thing and lock it in forever. Geez, we're within a sixteenth of an inch. So oh yeah. Pretty happy. A little bit over, probably a little bit better than a little under. So. Yeah. That's a half a wrap. Could have gone either way. We'll take that. If you're curious for more on Tyler's rig, leave a comment below as to a subsequent chapter, possibly in the future. Your respirator? Maybe. Garrett was deep in sawdust wilderness, stocking up planks to finish sheathing. We have, give or take, like 20 planks to the transom, and we started on July 27th on the starboard side, and we're nearly halfway there. This was August, and it took another full month till September 27th before the last sheathing plank was secure. 
then the whole other side. Man glitter. My man glitter. It's your man glitter. <laughs> Shit. You look ready for cold beer. Oh yeah. We'll hose you down. <laughs> yeah, right. I've been needing to mill more lumber for a while now. So yeah. it's good. So we've got just this much to do. So we're hoping to get that done today. And then that minus where we have to move the stands, which we have to get the yard to move. So we're gonna wait until we finish uh, the port side also to have them move it because they charge you, I don't know, some money to move them and might as well just do it all at once instead of one then the other. So the starboard side will be completely done except for like 20, 20 planks, give or take 20 planks where the stands are. So we're cruising along. Um, I think it's now been about two weeks since we started and a week we were working on doing this. The other week we've sort of been playing hooky a little bit. Um, still managed to finish our chain plates or at least finish to the point uh, before launching and then there'll be more work with them after we launch the boat. But we got that done and um, yeah, I had a friend come into town. I had my birthday. Garrett's mom's birthday's coming up, so we had dinner with her and his family. And then my dad's birthday's today. Uh, so it's been a busy, busy August. Um, but, you know, we've been able to manage to have some fun too, besides just work, so that's always nice. Um, but yeah, focusing on what's left. Uh, the sheathing's coming along really nicely. Garrett's uh, planed and cut more of our stock for it. So I think he said he's got like 60 some odd planks down reserve and he was doing a bunch of calculating this morning and I think he was figuring out it's about um, 40 some odd planks per side. So we should have more than enough to finish. So that's really exciting. We might need some more for where the, where the boat stands are but that's at least a week away, so no need to overthink about that one. And then we'll have a more exact number when we get there. To keep things interesting, we decided to have a little boatyard bet. How many planks will it take to reach the transom? Consciously or subconsciously, Garrett may have influenced the outcome because naturally he won. Three tiny pieces and then a triangle makes 21. So I've been a little bit sick the last um, maybe about five days now so I haven't really felt like uh, filming because I just wanted to work on the boat and it was easy enough to just push through that but too hard to sort of pick up the camera at the same time when snot's just ripping out of my nose. So anyway, before I go into too many gross details, we are working on the port side. So we're I think one more plank to reach the water line and then we'll have the 60 planks to go on the bottom. The chain plates were now in place with a single bolt so we can better adjust the angle after the master stepped. But this means now we can paint the hall. I was invited to crew on Gaviota. Tony, Monica, and Pono are on their way home to Mexico, finally getting some sea miles after a more serious haul out than expected, which is how we met.
routine haul out can quickly become deck repair, pulling your rudder, and rebedding everything. Tony was a happy captain to be sailing his boat south. This leg was just to Santa Cruz, but it could have been Hawaii. I was just as happy. I feel on a sailboat gliding through the ocean is mesmerizing. Only then to be topped by Tony trusting me to bring her into the dock. Oh man, after my own heart. Back home, Garrett just couldn't wait. He had to paint her. Red. was done soon enough and the next phase began. Two points up in the bow needed triangular planks as well as two in the stern, but the final phase before bottom paint was to fill all the screws and sand and plane the hull fair. So I got pretty far yesterday. Got from the water line down to the chine, and then this forward section where Garrett already sanded. And then I started on the port side before he sanded. And then we only have to do it once. So I got from the bow, and I got the second part done. I'm on to the third section out of four. I got from there. And then I've got like seven left. And then the final quarter. And I think Garrett's gonna keep sanding on the starboard side. So maybe I'll fill holes there after. And then still the water line to the chine on the port side. But it's going pretty quick. Maybe I can get them all filled today. So what they say about the boat stands? No, um, <clears throat> Mike wasn't in the office, but uh, I talked to Corey and she's going to... Um, Relay the message? Yeah, so she said it would be today. Cool. Gets in. Sweet. Yeah. All right, time to play some music. Look at this. That's some serious man glitter you got going on. Serious man glitter, serious man. <laughs> Total crap, right? 
they just blew up. Are you done? No. Shit. It's halfway. Let's see if I can fix it. I don't know, it's like eating at the plastic too. <laughs> That's some serious planing work. <laughs> Yeah, that belt sander's like 30 pounds. Did you have to go just to the sander? The hand plane, try that at all? I might try it, but I don't know if that's doing any better. Are you gonna go back over everything and sand it? Yeah. Anyway? That should go quick though. But this is just the planer craft out like back there. So I've done this much, but yeah. with the planer it goes like super fast because I'm just trying to knock down the highs and lows and get the tar off. Yeah. But doing all of it with the festival takes so much longer. We're so close, Garrett. A close up of his face. Uh, oh my goodness. You have messiness everywhere. Reed, uh, Garrett's brother, who's helped us out a couple times, you've seen him on maybe a few episodes. He's been in the yard for the last like. Uh, maybe two months or something and he's launching his boat right now so I'm walking from our boat back to the launch ramp Woo! <laughs> Garrett's already over here Reed hauled out to paint but ended up fiberglassing a massive blister and replacing and rebedding his through hauls Imua has something like 13 through hauls, which is a bit excessive. She's touching. Checking on her through hauls and everything inside. Reed took care of all of them but two, which caused him a false launch a few weeks prior. And there's nothing worse than watching your boat get hauled right back out. Hey Garrett, how's it looking? Uh, all good so far. Cool. We've checked 99 out of 100 through holes that he has. <laughs> yeah. No leaks this time. <laughs> Reed's been working on his first episode, so I'll include the link to his channel when it's released. <laughs> Imua is a Landfall 39, and Reed shook out her cobwebs in Kalama, Washington and now gives her room to gallop in the bay. Eventually, she'll see warmer waters. Eventually, we'll all see warmer waters. Woo! Dude, that waterline, absolutely perfect, man. How'd it feel to see Reed's boat launch? 
second friend in a week. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Oh, super motivating. We're next. We're next. It's funny, like running over, seeing his boat going in, covered in sawdust. Yeah. Like mask, goggles, everything. Well, we're still very much on the hard, but yes. Yeah. Speaking of that, I'm gonna cut some more wood. The pre-launch list is short, really short. Install our single through haul weld and mount the bow plate for the bob stay, then bottom paint. Most of you know we launched the boat. That was always the goal, but never the ending. But more on that next time. <laughs>